Okay, this is topic five, modern warfare from unit six, an introduction to Christian ethics. In this unit, you will be studying the causes of war, the just war tradition in Christianity, and its continuing relevance for today. You'll all be looking at the ethics of modern warfare, including the use of weapons of mass destruction and the morality of a nuclear deterrence. You'll also be looking at the, de the debate about the human and economic costs of war, the victims of war, including refugees, child soldiers and innocent civilians. And last but not least, you'll be looking at the debate about pacifism, taking into account of different religious and ethical viewpoints. So key words that you need to know for this topic. A conventional war is an attempt by one state to either defend itself against another state. War could be waged in order to try and take something such as land, resources or freedom from another power. An example of a conventional war is two nations fighting each other, for example Russia and Ukraine. A civil war is a war between organised groups within the same state or country. The troubles would be regarded as a civil war. A just war. Although war is regarded as immoral, if it is for justice it could be considered morally permissible. From early times Christians have tried to justify war and to make rules and conditions for that. And we will look at the just war theory later in this video. A holy war. Some religions have claimed that wars can be holy if they are fought in the name of God. Christians and Muslims have a tradition of holy wars and we will be looking at a few examples. Pacifism is the refusal to use violence or to fight in wars. And we're going to be looking at the example of Jesus from scripture in order to support that way of life. And last but not least, we will be looking at conscientious objectors. This is a person who refuses on the basis of conscience to fight in a war. Conscientious objectors may serve in non-combatant roles such as stretcher bearers or medics within battle, but they will not fire a weapon. A conscientious objector does not have to be a pacifist. The individual may just object to a particular war. And we will be looking at Muhammad Ali and his objection to the Vietnam War. What are the causes of war? 1. To gain land or resources. Throughout the 18th and 19th century, Britain invaded many nations throughout the world to expand its empire. The most valuable of these was India, as it was full of natural resources and vast amounts of wealth. Another example of a country invading another country to gain land and resources was during World War II when Adolf Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 in order to create Lebensraum or living space for the German nation. According to Russian government figures, the USSR losses within post-war borders now stand at 26.6 million, including 8 to 9 million due to famine and the seas. This invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 was known as Operation Barbarossa. 2. Another cause of war is to help other nations. A coalition or a group of nations assisted Kuwait in the first Gulf War in the early 1990s when it was invaded by the dictator Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein and his Iraqi army was eventually defeated and pushed out of Kuwait and back into Iraq. Another example of nations helping other nations was whenever the UK and France declared war on Germany when Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939. 3. To gain power Many wars have been fought to gain power through control of government. For example, you may remember from year 8, the invasion of England in 1066 by William the Conqueror was aimed to take the throne from Harold Godwinson. 
However, in a more modern context, some people believe that Vladimir Putin has invaded Ukraine in order to install a Ukrainian leader who is pro-Russian. This would give him power over Ukraine. Another example was of course during World War II when Adolf Hitler wanted his Nazi regime to gain power and dominance over Europe. 4. Fight for freedom. Many countries have fought wars of independence in order to gain freedom from a ruling power. Throughout Irish history there have been wars waged for freedom. For example, the United Irishmen Rebellion in 1798, the Easter Rising in 1916 and the Anglo-Irish War in 1919 which eventually resulted in the formation of the Irish Free State. This enabled the Republic of Ireland to gain freedom from British rule. 5. In self-defence Once invaded by another nation, countries have to fight back. For example, when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, the Poles fought back and even when defeated, they continued to fight through the use of guerrilla warfare. Another example is Ukrainians fighting in defence of their country from Russian aggression. US sources estimate that 2,000 to 4,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed in defence of their country whilst Russia has sustained over 10,000 casualties. Both sides have sustained thousands of wounded. 6. For religious reasons or holy war. The best example of this are the Crusades that occurred in the Middle East between 1095 and 1487. Large numbers of European Christian soldiers went on crusade to capture the holy city of Jerusalem from Muslim invaders. The Crusades ended in defeat for the armies of Christendom. A more modern example is that some Muslims believe in jihad or holy war against those who threaten Islam. On August 23rd, 1996, Osama bin Laden declared war on the United States. The 9-11 attacks were planned by bin Laden and his terrorist group of Al-Qaeda. 7. To get rid of a dictator. People have gone to war in order to stand up against oppression and to remove dictators from power. For example, some people argue that it was right to go to war with Nazi Germany in order to remove Adolf Hitler from power. Towards the end of the war, the full extent of the Holocaust was revealed. It is believed that over 6 million of Europe's Jews were murdered by the Nazi regime. In 2003, Saddam Hussein's brutal regime was removed from power in Iraq. Saddam's regime had violated many human rights laws and committed numerous war crimes, including the killing of thousands of his own people with chemical weapons. One such attack killed between 3,200 and 5,000 people and injuring between 7,000 to 10,000, more or most of them being civilians. A US-led coalition of troops invaded Iraq under the pretext that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, which he was intending to use. However, no nuclear weapons were ever found. 8. To oppose oppression. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is one of the world's most enduring conflicts, with the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip reaching 45 years of conflict. Various attempts have been made to resolve the conflict as part of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. However, attempts of a compromise through negotiations have been unsuccessful. Palestinians accuse Israel of oppression through the arrest and killing of innocent Palestinians and the stealing of their land. The Israeli government accuses Palestinians of supporting terrorist groups such as Hamas and launching rockets into Israeli controlled towns and villages resulting in the loss of human life. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is incredibly complex as both sides believe that they are entitled to the land. 
Consequences of war can include civilian casualties, refugees, the creation of child soldiers, environmental damage, death and destruction, physical and mental trauma, and an economic cost to war. What are refugees? Refugee is a person who is forced to flee from his or her country. This is often the result of persecution, war or other violence. An ongoing refugee crisis began in Europe in late February 2022 after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. More than 3.9 million refugees have left Ukraine, whilst an estimated 6.5 million people have been displaced within the country. The immediate needs of refugees include emergency assistance in the form of clean water, sanitation, health care, as well as shelter, blankets, household goods and food. The next priority is to help support resettlement in another country where they are safe with the option of returning home eventually, if this is possible. Many countries and citizens have opened their doors to refugees, such as the UK and Ireland. However, most refugees from the Ukrainian war have been given shelter in neighbouring countries such as Poland, Moldova and Romania. Refugees are protected by international humanitarian law when they are in a state involved in armed conflict or have come from a situation of conflict. They must not be returned to situations where their life and freedom are at risk. Nearly 11 years on, the Syrian refugee crisis remains the largest displacement crisis globally. Nearly 5.7 million registered refugees, including almost 2.7 million children, live in Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. Child soldiers. The use of children under the age of 18 is considered a war crime. However, throughout the world, tens of thousands of children are given weapons and forced to fight for the government, armed forces or paramilitaries. According to Peace Direct, it is estimated that 250,000 to 300,000 children are fighting in wars all over the world. Recruited by force or lured by the false promise of an, an escape, from poverty. It is thought that 40% of child soldiers are girls. The UN defines child soldiers as children associated with armed forces and groups. Not all children have armed roles in these groups and may be used as spies, messengers, porters, servants or for sexual purposes. Children are more easily manipulated than adult fighters. Many children will fight on the front lines, often sustaining the brunt of the casualties. Not all children will fight. Many will be given jobs such as couriers and passing on messages. Girls are often forced into sexual slavery. Generally what happens is that children are abducted by armed groups, but some are lured there by the promise of education, security, money and status and others are persuaded or forced. The after effects can last a lifetime. Even if a child is released or they escape, they may find their families have been killed um, in the conflict. Evidence suggests that child soldiers are active in at least 14 countries, which include Afghanistan, Burma, the Central African Republic, Chad, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, India, Iraq, the Philippines, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Thailand and Yemen. Innocent civilians. Civilians are often caught in the crossfire or killed in bombings simply by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. World War II was one of the most deadly wars of all time. Deaths directly caused by the war including military and civilian fatalities are estimated between 50 and 56 million, with an additional estimation of 19 to 28 million deaths from war-related disease and famine. 
it is estimated that civilian deaths totaled 50 to 55 million during World War II. During a war, many people will die from illness due to a lack of clean water or food. Others become traumatized and suffer long-term mental health. For example, civilians are often physically injured, left disabled and suffer from PTSD. This is often triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing something or witnessing it. Civilians are supposed to be protected during armed conflict by international humanitarian law. This states that civilians under the power of enemy forces must be protected against all forms of violence and degrading treatment, including murder and torture. The protection of civilians extends to those trying to help them, such as medical units and humanitarian groups providing essentials such as food, clothes and medical supplies. A humanitarian group that we will look at, look at is the Red Cross. The UN stated as of the 28th of March that there have been at least 2,571 casualties in Ukraine, that is civilian casualties. 977 have been killed and over 1,500 injured. This has included the elderly and even an 18 month baby. Most of the civilian casualties recorded were caused by the use of explosive weapons with a wide impact area, including shelling from heavy artillery and multiple launch rocket systems and missiles and airstrikes. Another victim of war is of course the soldiers who are fighting. War adversely affects combatants and non-combatants alike both physically and emotionally. Death, injury, sexual violence, malnutrition, illness and disability are some of the most threatening physical consequences of war, while post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety are some of the emotional effects of war. The terror and horror spread by the violence of war disrupts lives and severs relationships and families leaving individuals and communities emotionally distressed. As in every war, the wounded are far more numerous than those that are killed. Common combat injuries include second and third degree burns, broken bones, shrapnel wounds, brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, nerve damage, paralysis, loss of sight and hearing post-traumatic stress disorder and limb loss. Although trained for war, most soldiers hope the conflict never materializes. Soldiers are sent to the front to fight and to kill. Although soldiers spend con a considerable amount of time training for war, many soldiers find it difficult to cope with the results of war. For example, in one major study of 60,000 Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, 13.5% of deployed and non-deployed veterans screened positive for PTSD, while other studies show that the rate to be as high as 20 to 30%. As many as half a million US troops who served in these wars over the past years have been diagnosed with PTSD. Traumatic brain injury and PTSD are also major issues amongst Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. High rates of PTSD amongst US veterans are alarming and what this has ultimately resulted in is that returning soldiers receive assistance because they suffer from a variety of problems such as reintegrating into their families and communities, joblessness and of course drug addictions. Wars cost money. For example, it is estimated that the US spent 4.8 trillion on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Wars can also lead to an economic um, cost for countries. For example, wars can result in a rise in inflation. Inflation is also known as the rise in the cost of living. 
For example, the war in Syria made prices rise by 723% between March 2011 and November 2015. Price of utilities, of food and oil rose. At this moment in time, the UK is going through a period of inflation. The cost of oil and food is going up because of the impact of the Ukraine and Russian war. Additionally, war will increase national debt. Governments often have to borrow money um, in order to um, cover the costs of going to war. For example, during World War II, the UK government borrowed from the USA, which obviously took many years to pay back. In order to pay back this debt, governments often would have to cut services such as healthcare and education. Another economic cost of war is of course unemployment because of the destruction of infrastructure. Buildings, roads, schools, hospitals and public buildings can obviously be destroyed during war and this will obviously result in people losing their jobs. Last but not least, another economic cost of war is the, the decline in tourism. No one is going to want to visit a region or a country that is in war. Tourism is often an important um, is an important um, aspect of a country's economy. If there are no tourists, then external money is not coming in to the country being infested into their economy. However, there are some economic benefits of war. For example, increased military spending can generate some positive economic benefits through the creation of employment. For example, if a country goes to war, then more individuals are maybe getting involved in the war effort, getting involved in factories, signing up uh, to the army and so on. It can also lead to technological developments, such as during World War II, the invention of radar. And during World War II, it was estimated that for the US, that 17 million new civilian jobs were created because of the war. Industrial productivity increased by 96%. And corporate tax or business tax profits doubled, which meant that more money could be used for schools, hospitals, and public infrastructure. However, it is important to note that the economic costs of war generally outweigh the benefits. Is war a waste of money? The points addressed in the previous page could be used to help answer this question. Some people believe that war is a waste of money because wars cause millions of innocent lives to be lost and human suffering on a huge scale and therefore it can never be justified. What price can you put on a human life? There is also damage to buildings, resources, loss of essential services, such as healthcare, education, and so on, and damage to the environment. It will take billions of pounds to fix all of these after the war has been concluded. Money could be put towards education and healthcare rather than being infested in the military and buying weapons. As of March 2022, it is estimated that there are three to four years of NHS waiting lists. Some people argue that money being put towards war could be better used in helping alleviating poverty and the crisis in our health service. The UK government spent 4.46 billion in 2020, or 8,467 every minute on its nuclear weapons program. In 2015, the Ministry of Defence estimated that four new nuclear submarines would cost the British taxpayer 31 billion. Spending on defence was almost 40 billion in 2019 to 2020. This money could be used to help people who are homeless, in poverty, or easing the healthcare crisis. 
However, other people disagree and say that war is not a waste of money, as there are always examples in the news of violent and aggressive attacks by one country on another. The only way to stop this is by armed conflict. For example, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 showed that countries need to invest in their military in order to deter other countries. Others argue that war is not a waste of money as pacifist methods, which we're going to be looking at, are not effective in many cases. Peaceful demonstration, strikes and economic sanctions are not immediately effective and so wars are needed. For example, economic sanctions against Russia will be effective in the long term, um, but in the short term they will not be. Therefore, some people argue that war is required now. Others believe that war is not a waste of money as sometimes dictators need to be challenged. Declaring war has been shown to be effective against Hitler and Saddam Hussein. Dictators like these have violated human rights by killing and torturing their citizens. Countries must be willing to stand up against this oppression. And last but not least, the ultimate role of any government is to um, look after their citizens. In order to look after their citizens and to protect them, they must have viable armies in order to do so, to protect them from aggressive attacks. Christianity and the Just War Theory The early Christians refused to fight in wars as they did not believe they had the right to take someone else's life. And this would come from the teachings from the Bible, particularly Jesus' example, and of course sanctity of life arguments which you can use for this topic. They were inspired by the peaceful nature of Jesus' ministry and therefore they tried to save a life without violence. Christians ultimately believe that killing is immoral as it says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. They believe that killing violates the sanctity of life as we are all created in the image of God and that Christians should be followers of Christ they should be peacemakers, as Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. However, in 370 AD, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. In order to secure the empire from its enemies, early Christian theologians came up with some justifications for going to war. The just war theory was first stated by Augustine, but it was most fully developed by St. Thomas Aquinas. And this eventually became known as the just war theory. It is important that you need to know the name of Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. The aim of the just war theory is to ensure that war is justifiable and sets down conditions that have to be met if a war is to be considered just or legally and morally reasonable. The just war theory sets conditions for when it is just to go to war and how a just war should be fought. The just war theory states that war can only be declared by a lawful authority. An example would be the government or ruler of a country. Ordinary people or terrorists could not declare a just war. A just war must have a just cause. The cause of the war must be just, or it must be justifiable. The war must be fought with the intention to establish good or to correct evil. Its purpose must ultimately to promote peace after the war is concluded. Examples may include defending the innocent in self-defense, helping a neighboring country that has faced invasion. A just war must be a last resort. War must be the last resort. A country should only go to war after all diplomatic negotiations have been tried and failed. These might include discussions, negotiations and the employment of economic sanctions. There must of course be a likelihood of success. The war must have a reasonable chance of success. It would be immoral to go ahead with a war 
on Leicester is a reasonable chance that the objective for waging war can be achieved. So how should a just war be fought? No harm must be sustained upon innocent people. Only sufficient force must be used. Civilians must not be involved, including the use of child soldiers. War must be waged with as much moderation as possible, and so indiscriminate bombing, torture, rape, looting and massacres are prohibited. A war must be proportionate. The relationship between ends and means must be proportionate. There cannot be excessive destruction. There must be just enough force to achieve victory and only against legitimate targets such as um, soldiers. Civilians should be protected. And last but not least, peace must be restored at the end of the conflict. Is the just war theory relevant today? Well, some people believe that the just war theory is relevant today because it specifies conditions for judging whether or not it is right to go to war. And it also highlights the conditions for how a war should be fought. Although it was developed by St. Thomas Aquinas, a Catholic thinker, it can be used across multiple faiths and even secular societies, so therefore it is relevant. It is a universal theory, which means that all cultures, all religions and nations can apply it to their own conflicts. The Just War theory provides a useful framework for individuals and political groups to use their discussions of possible wars, and it is a guide to whether or not a war can be justified. It makes leaders really think about the morality of the war that they are proposing. Countries, governments and people should always think carefully when deciding to go to war. The Just War Theory gives reasons to think. The Just War Theory is not intended to justify wars, but it is intended to prevent them by showing that going to war or by showing that going to war except in certain limited circumstances is wrong. Therefore, it can motivate states and governments to find other ways of resolving conflict, such as negotiations and economic sanctions. The just war theory enables countries a last resort, particularly if they have to deal with an immoral country or a dictator. Sometimes war may be necessary and right, even though it may not be good. In the case of a country, that has been invaded by an occupying force, war may be the only way to restore justice. Pope Benedict XVI has said that defending oneself and others is a duty. When wars are fought to protect people, it could be seen as an example of Jesus teaching love your neighbour as you love yourself. Jesus stood up for the marginalised in society. Stronger countries should stand up for weaker countries, particularly if they have been invaded. The Bible also gives reasons to go to war. The idea of taking human life is wrong, but countries have a moral duty to protect their citizens. The ultimate role of a government is to protect its people and therefore the just war theory is relevant today as war is sometimes inevitable. It's also relevant today as a war should be declared by a government, not a terrorist or a dictator. It's also relevant today as it stipulates that war should be a last resort and negotiation should be tried first. Just War Theory encourages nations to use every possible alternative before engaging in war. And last but not least, when talking about proportionality and how a war should be fought, the Just War Theory proposes that innocent civilians should not be targeted and peace should be restored at the end. This is obviously relevant today. It would not be moral to indiscriminately kill civilians or not plan to restore peace after the war has come to its conclusion. However, other people argue that the just war theory is not relevant today. Some people argue that the idea of trying to justify war is immoral, for example, absolute pacifists. Morality must always oppose deliberate violence, but the just war theory seems to make violence acceptable rather than trying to restrain it. 
War violates the sanctity of life arguments. Christians should never justify violence as Jesus said, whoever slaps you in the right cheek, turn the other to him. He also said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. As well as that, they argue that the just war fear is unrealistic as it does not apply to conditions of modern uh, conflicts. The just war theory was formulated in the 13th century, almost 800 years ago, and therefore it is clearly out of date with modern weapons. The existence of chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction requires a different approach to the problem. The damage caused by these weapons cannot be controlled, so the condition of proportionality cannot be met if they are used. This is also similar with the use of nuclear weapons. Even if these weapons targeted military sites, their destructive power is so immense that large numbers of innocent people would be killed. There is also the possibility that any use of nuclear weapons could lead, lead to all-out nuclear war. The overall aim of war should be to achieve victory as quickly and as cheaply as possible. If the cause is just, then no restriction should be placed on achieving it, and therefore some people believe that the idea of proportionality is not re relevant today. For example, during World War II, the US Army dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in order to bring the war to an immediate end. US generals believed that if they didn't drop the bombs, then the US Army would suffer an estimated 1.7 to 4 million American casualties and, and an estimate of 5 to 10 million Japanese fatalities. It's estimated that roughly 70 to 135,000 people died in Hiroshima and 60,000 to 80,000 died in Nagasaki, both from acute exposure to the blasts and from long-term side effects. The just war theory would never allow nuclear weapons to be used. It could never be justified under the just war theory. According to statistics from 2021, 56% of Americans still believe that the dropping of these weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was moral. Under the just war theory, nuclear weapons would never be moral. As well as that, modern warfare has become very complicated and it is too simplistic to say that there must be a just cause and proper intention. There are conflicts, for example, like the Palestinian conflict in the Middle East that is incredibly complicated. How does someone know if a war is just or not? Others believe that the just war theory is not relevant because no one can know from the outset of war if there is a reasonable chance of success or whether or not the good gained by winning the war will be greater than the evil caused by it. For example, the United States went into Afghanistan in 2001. They did not expect there to be, they did not expect to be in Afghanistan for very long. However, in 2021, 20 years later, the US Army had left Afghanistan. They had not planned to be there that long. Therefore, it is impossible to know what the chance of success is going to be. Sometimes action has to be taken swiftly and therefore there is no time for peaceful methods. What if a country invades a country by surprise? Negotiations, economic sanctions will not work. And last but not least, Catholic peace groups have said that the just war theory has too often been used to endorse rather than prevent or limit war. They believe that a new framework is needed that is consistent with gospel non-violence. WMDs are weapons of mass destruction. These weapons can be easily remembered with the acronym ABC weapons, which stand for Atomic, Biological and Chemical Weapons. Biological and chemical weapons have been banned under the Geneva Protocol. Atomic weapons. These are bombs or weapons that use nuclear energy to cause an explosion. A nuclear blast can kill millions of people. Those near the site of detonation will die immediately, while others hundreds of miles away will die slowly and painfully from radiation sickness. Nuclear weapons have been used twice in human history. 
one in Hiroshima and the second in Nagasaki at the end of World War II. The deployment of these weapons killed hundreds of thousands of people, both immediately and because of radiation sickness and burns from after the detonation of the weapons. B. Biological weapons. These weapons release a harmful germ or virus and death is caused by infectious disease. Biological weapons can also pollute the land for many years. Examples can include anthrax, which are capable of causing large amounts of deaths in a very short amount of time. They can also incapacitate humans and cause disease in animals and plants. They too have been banned by the Geneva Protocol but they have still been developed in recent decades and deployed. Chemical weapons. These weapons release a poisonous substance on explosion, which contaminates a large area. This can cause severe reactions in any living thing, including choking, burning skin and lung damage. Their damage cannot be estimated as it is dependent on wind direction. In 2003, Saddam Hussein's brutal regime was removed from power in Iraq. Saddam's regime had violated many human rights laws and committed numerous war crimes, including the killing of thousands with chemical weapons. One such attack killed between 3,200 and 5,000 people and injuring 7 to 10,000 more, most of them being civilians. An international ban on the use of chemical and biological weapons came into force after the First World War. This became known as the Geneva Protocol. However, there are concerns worldwide that this ban is being ignored. The Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons was established in 1970. It gives rules for the use of nuclear weapons around the world and aims to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. The debate around nuclear weapons revolves around the idea of whether or not nuclear deterrence works. So what is a deterrence? Deterrence theory holds that nuclear weapons are intended to deter or to put other states off from attacking with their nuclear weapons through the promise of retaliation and possibly mutually assured destruction. There are many groups which seek for nuclear disarmament, one being the International Atomic Energy Agency. This nuclear watchdog of the United Nations aims to promote the peaceful use of atomic energy while trying to make sure that the technology is not used for military purposes. The campaign for nuclear disarmament. This campaign to scrap nuclear weapons and to create genuine security for future generations. It is funded entirely by their members and supporters. And Global Zero. The international movement for the elimination of nuclear weapons. It is made up of a visionary group of 300 international leaders and experts who support the plan to eliminate all nuclear weapons by 2030. Global Zero is challenging the 20th century idea of basing national security on the threat of mass destruction. The following graphic gives an estimation of the global nuclear weapons around the world. Clearly from the graphic, it suggests that the United States and Russia are the leading nuclear powers in the world today. Are nuclear weapons an effective deterrent? Some people believe that possessing nuclear weapons stops other countries attacking them because of the real threat that nuclear weapons are used in response. It does seem to work as there has not been a world war since 1945. The fear that another country may use nuclear weapons deters other countries from attacking them in the first place. Therefore, they are an effective deterrent. For example, many countries are reluctant to attack Russia during the Ukrainian-Russian war because Russia has nuclear weapons and could use them. 
Nuclear weapons are also an effective deterrent as they cause awful consequences and no country will want to use them or face a similar attack. Having seen the effects of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, modern nuclear weapons would be more deadly and destructive. It is estimated that modern nuclear weapons are 80 times more destructive than those used during uh, or at the end of World War II. No government would want to put their citizens or country at risk of nuclear annihilation. Nuclear weapons also give a country a means to bargain. For example, nuclear power states will aim to do everything in order to avoid nuclear war. This means that they will be more willing to negotiate. However, others argue that nuclear weapons are not a deterrence. Some people believe that countries that develop nuclear weapons are playing a very dangerous game as the growth of nuclear weapons and the number of countries that now have them makes their use more likely, not less. If other countries know that another country only has nuclear weapons as a deterrent and would never actually use them, then they don't make a very good deterrent. Governments must be willing to use nuclear weapons in order to make them an effective deterrent. According to the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, the United Kingdom spent $4.46 billion in 2020 on its nuclear weapons program. In 2015, the Ministry of Defence estimated that four new nuclear submarines would cost the British taxpayer $31 billion. The fast amounts of money spent on nuclear weapons could be better spent on healthcare, education, alleviating poverty. So rather than using or putting money um, into nuclear weapons as a deterrent, particularly when countries or governments are unwilling to use them, some people argue that we should scrap nuclear weapons and put money into our economies and into our healthcare and into education rather than spending them on war. Nuclear weapons make the world a very dangerous place. What if these weapons fall into the hands of an unstable dictator or a terrorist organization that are committed to destruction? There are thousands of active nuclear weapons in the world today. It only takes one minor mistake between nuclear powers for war to erupt. And last but not least, Pope Benedict XVI of the Roman Catholic Church has stated that nuclear war has no victors, only victims. All Christians oppose nuclear weapons. The Roman Catholic Church objects to the use of nuclear weapons. They object to the use of nuclear weapons because they are completely indiscriminate and have long term effects. Because they kill innocent civilians and cause environmental damage because of radiation poisoning, they should never be used. They're also totally disproportionate to any possible success that may follow. Remember, peace should be established at the end of a war. The use of nuclear weapons opens the possibility of mutually assured destruction. Therefore, nobody would win from a nuclear war. As Pope Benedict XVI said, with weapons of mass destruction, the possibility of success is small. There are no victors, only victims. The Catholic Church is also against nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction because the cost of researching, building and maintaining these weapons is so great that it prevents governments from spending money to improve people's lives, such as getting people out of poverty, helping the, the health service and improving education. And last but not least, the Catholic Church says that the possession of these weapons increases tension and fear, making the world less safe. Pope Francis has said that there is urgent need to work for a world free of nuclear weapons. So what does the Bible teach on war? Well, the Old Testament is full of passages which support nation states going to war. In fact, there are many passages which state that God commands his people to go to war and even how to fight in it. For example, 
In Numbers it says, The Lord listened to Israel's plea and gave the Canaanites over to them. They completely destroyed them in their towns. They fought against Midian and the Lord commanded Moses and killed every man. Deuteronomy states, When the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. In the book of Joshua it says, They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. This is an example of total warfare. In Joshua it also says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go and attack I. In Exodus it says, An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. You will remember this passage from our topic two matters of life and death with the idea of retaliation or revenge. It also says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. And perhaps the easiest quote to remember, There is a time for everything, a time for war and a time for peace. Clearly in the Old Testament, there are passages which justify going to war. Passivism is a belief that war and violence are not a solution to conflict. Peaceful methods of resolution could be used instead. Some people believe you cannot justify going to war or resorting to violence. These people are called pacifists. For many people, pacifism is more than simply a refusal to fight. It is a moral stance which includes action to promote justice and human rights. Pacifists are motivated by a respect for human life and the desire for a peaceful world. There are different sorts of pacifism that you need to be aware of, but they all include the idea that conflict should be settled by peaceful means instead of resorting to violence. The first type of pacifism is absolute pacifism. Absolute pacifists believe it is never right to take part in any war or violence, even in self-defense. Nothing can justify deliberate taking of human life. Many Christians are pacifists as they believe in the teachings and example of Jesus support a pacifist approach to life. However, the Quakers are the only branch of the Christian church to adopt pacifism officially. Conditional pacifism. Conditional pacifists believe that there are some circumstances where it is acceptable to fight. Using violence may have a better outcome than maintaining peace. Many Christian denominations are open to the inevitability of war. For example, the Roman Catholic Church accepts the just war theory and accepts that there is sometimes a just cause for going to war. And the last type of pacifism that you need to be aware of is selective pacifism. There are different levels of war and violence, with some being more acceptable than others. Selective pacifists oppose a certain type of war, such as one that involves weapons of mass destruction, for example, nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction, because they are indiscriminate and are so devastating. Nowadays, most democratic countries accept that people have a right to follow their conscience and refuse to fight in wars. These people are known as conscientious objectors. Many pacifists who take this position are actively engaged in alternative activities. For example, this can include going into war zones and helping those affected. For example, the international humanitarian organization, the Red Cross. Now, the Red Cross are currently operating in Ukraine at this moment in time. A pacifist can be an active member of a protest group campaigning against current conflicts. And as well as that, pacifists can campaign for peaceful solutions to conflicts, perhaps being used as a pressure group upon governments in order to encourage them to act. Examples of conscientious objectors. 
During World War II, more than 72,000 sought CO status and another 6,000 were jailed for refusing to cooperate with draft boards at all. Desmond Dawes was the first conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honour for his numerous acts of valour as a medic during World War II. He refused to carry a weapon into battle. Desmond Dawes is credited with the saving of 75 soldiers during one of the bloodiest battles of World War II in the Pacific. Dawes was inspired by the peaceful example of Jesus. The story of Desmond Dawes was recently portrayed in the hit movie Hacksaw Ridge. Muhammad Ali had been a long opponent of the Vietnam War and had fought being eligible for the military draft for some time. He said, why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam why so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and de denied simple human rights. On the 20th of June 1967, Ali was convicted of draft evasion and sentenced to five years in prison. He was fined $10,000 and was banned from boxing for three years. So what are some examples of non-violent protest or pacifist methods? Some Christians believe that non-violent protest is the best response to aggression, violence and injustice. Non-violent protest is not the same as doing nothing. Non-violent protest is based on peaceful demonstrations which do not resort to violence. Examples of non-violent protest can include marches and demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, economic sanctions, sit-ins, using your folk disobeying unjust laws and the refusal to pay fines and bail for unjust arrests. An example of a non-violent protest happened recently in Russia, where a Russian woman ran onto the set of an evening news program on Russian state television with the poster reading, no war, stop the war, don't believe propaganda, they lie to you here, Russians against war, she yelled stop the war, no to war before the camera cut away. These are all examples of non-violent protests against war. Famous Christian pacifists include Martin Luther King Jr. who was the leader of the civil rights movement in the USA. Inspired by the example of Jesus, Martin Luther King used peaceful tactics to achieve his goal of racial equality in the United States. He said, peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we achieve, arrive at that goal. John Hume was the leader of the SDLP and one of the civil rights leaders in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. His determination and conviction to bring peace in Northern Ireland helped establish the Good Friday Agreement, which brought the Troubles to an end. He said, the basis of peace and stability in any society has to be the fullest respect of the human rights of all people. John Hume was willing to sit down and speak to paramilitaries in order to achieve peace in Northern Ireland. Dorothy Day campaigned for social justice and set up aid centres or relief movements for the poor and marginalised in the USA. She re refused violent protests as a way to accomplish her goals. She said wars are as strong, sorry, words are as strong and powerful as bombs and napalm. A famous non-Christian pacifist is of course Gandhi. One of the most important figures in the 20th century, Gandhi, who led a successful movement to free India from British rule and gain independence in 1947. But unlike revolutions in other countries, the massive rebellion wasn't a violent one. Instead, Gandhi's followers staged sit-ins and other protests and willingly allowed themselves to be arrested by colonial authorities. Gandhi staged several hunger strikes in protest against British occupation of his country. He once said, an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind. 
He only wanted to protest peacefully for the independence of India from the British Empire. Gandhi's pacifist movement was eventually successful and resulted in India gaining its independence from Britain in 1947. Gandhi said, non-violence is the summit of bravery. I am prepared to die, but there is no cause for which I am prepared to kill. I offer you peace. I offer you love. I offer you friendship. I see your beauty. I hear your need. I feel your feelings. And perhaps his most famous, taken from the Old Testament and changed, an eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind. So Christian views on pacifism. Many Christians, including Roman Catholics, acknowledge that sometimes war is inevitable, but Christians must do their best to avoid conflict. Because Jesus taught it is much better to try to bring peace than to use violence. Jesus said, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Jesus also said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And he also said in the Garden of Gethsemane, whenever he was being arrested, after Peter attacked one of the chief priest's guards with um, his sword, Jesus said, All who take the sword will perish by the sword. The early Christians would not fight. For example, Martin of Tours resigned from the army when he became a Christian, saying, it is not right for me to fight. As alluded to in the previous slides, Martin Luther King, a Baptist um, Christian leader of the US civil rights movement, refused to use violence. The Quakers promote pacifism and they act as stretcher bearers and medics within the First World War. They are an example of absolute pacifists. And after the Second World War, some Catholics founded Pax Christi, the Peace of Christ, to try and reconcile war-torn countries. Arguments for and against pacifism. Christians believe in the sanctity of human life. Therefore, Christians should always advocate for absolute pacifism, as no life should be wasted through violence. For example, Quakers are one example of Christians who advocate for absolute pacifism. Some Christians also believe that it is always wrong to fight. Pacifist methods such as negotiations, economic sanctions and strikes should replace needless violence. Pacifists also argue that war is wasteful and destructive. Wars cost so much human suffering and death and injury and human rights abuse and they also create orphans, refugees and many humanitarian crises. Pacifists also argue that war drains a country's resources which could be better used in healthcare, education and the building of infrastructure. Pacifists highlight that there are different types of pacifism and it could be argued that some are more realistic than others. For example, is it more realistic to be a selective pacifist or an absolute pacifist? War never solves the problem. Jesus taught that peace is better than violence. If killing is wrong, then war must be wrong, as war is basically a matter of killing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that violence should not be repaid with more violence. As well as that, Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, those who live by the sword will perish by it. And last but not least, pacifists look at examples such as Martin Luther King and Gandhi as examples of whereby non-violent action can work. However, there are those that argue that pacifism is not realistic today. A government has a duty to protect its citizens and its citizens have a moral duty to carry out tasks in war. There have always been examples in the news of violent and aggressive attacks by one country on another. The only way to stop this is by armed conflict. Sometimes negotiations fail and war is necessary to bring about justice for the weak and to defend the innocent. A country cannot sit by and allow another country to invade it. 
In the Bible, God gives his approval for wars to be fought. This shows that armed conflict can sometimes be justified. The Bible allows war. The Old Testament is full of examples. For example, it says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It also says that there is a time for peace and a time for war. Non-pacifists also argue that a country that isn't preferred, that isn't prepared to fight can be seen as weak. Pacifist methods such as peaceful demonstrations, strikes and economic sanctions are not immediately effective. Economic sanctions may take years to take effect. Sometimes evil dictators need to be challenged. Examples from recent history show that pacifism would not have worked against Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein. This is still true in the 21st century. The Catholic Church disproves of war but acknowledges that war is sometimes inevitable. The just war theory aims to limit war and sets conditions by which it should be fought. However, some members of the Vatican Conference have called on Pope Francis to renounce the Catholic Church's just war theory and develop a new doctrine of a just peace. And last but not least, it does appear that in the Bible, Jesus does use violence whenever he overthrows the money lenders' tables in the temple. Sometimes Christians justify this violence as standing up against injustice or oppression. Therefore, they would argue that in some cases, Christians have a moral obligation to stand up and to fight against injustice, even if that includes um, violence or using violence. Having looked at the Old Testament's teaching on war, we're now going to look at the New Testament, which is full of passages which supports the pursuit of peace. Jesus teaches his followers to pursue peace, love and mercy over violence and retaliation. Many Christians call Jesus the Prince of Peace. In the Old Testament, in Psalms, it says, turn from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. Jesus also said to love your neighbour as you love yourself, advocating love over violence. Jesus also said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. In the Ten Commandments it says, Thou shalt not kill. This is an absolute command and should not be broken. In war, violence occurs and killing occurs. Therefore, it violates this command. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus said, Live in peace with one another. St. Paul said, Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. In the Old Testament and Isaiah, there is a prophecy that nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. And St. Paul says in Corinthians, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the Lord of love and peace will be with you. So the efforts of Pope Francis. Recent popes such as Pope Francis have tried to bring about peaceful solutions to areas of conflict. Pope Francis said, War is madness. It also ruins the most beautiful work of his hands, human beings. War is irrational. Its only plan is to bring destruction. It seeks to grow by destroying. In 2013, Pope Francis urged people to pay for peace in eastern Ukraine when Russia invaded Crimea, highlighting the number of civilian casualties. In 2014, Pope Francis organised a meeting of prayer between the Presidents of Israel and Palestine. By using Jewish, Muslim and Christian prayers, he hoped to bring the two leaders into a position where change could occur. 
In 2014, Pope Francis organised a football match in Rome's Olympic Stadium to raise funds for children in need, particularly those affected by war. International players, including Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Jews and Muslims took part in an effort to break down barriers. Pope Francis spoke movingly during his address in St. Peter's Square on the 100th anniversary of World War I. He said, please stop. I ask you with all my heart, it's time to stop. Stop, please. Pope Francis has also said, hatred is not to be carried out in the name of God. War is not to be waged in the name of God. Therefore, Pope Francis is highlighting that there is no such thing as a holy war. And very recently, Pope Francis has delivered the following statements, one on his Twitter account, about the war in Ukraine. Every war worsens everyone's situation. Therefore, I renew my appeal. Enough. Stop it. Silence the weapons. Move seriously towards peace. And in his prayer for Ukraine, Pope Francis said, Let us together cry out from our hearts, never again war. Never again the clash of arms, never again so much suffering. We must never stop praying. Indeed, let us pray to God more intensely. Come, Lord, Prince of Peace, make us instruments and reflections of your peace. So the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church believes that everyone in every nation has a right to protect itself, but it emphasizes the need to use non-violent approaches to resolve conflicts. Pope Francis wrote, war never again, never again war. But he has acknowledged that force may be necessary in self-defense or to protect the weak. Organizations such as CAFID have worked in regions of war such as Sierra Leone. CAFOID set up orphanages, rehabilitation programs to help children who have been forced to become child soldiers to get back to a normal way of life. Aid to the church in need. The civil war in Syria has caused thousands to flee. Others have lost their homes and needed shelter. Aid to the church in need has provided shelter, blankets, medicines and food both inside and outside of Syria. As well as that, Pope Francis has encouraged Catholics to take in refugees from the Syrian conflict and of course the Ukrainian conflict as well. Caritas International. After the fighting in Niger in 2015, many people fled their homes and were living under trees. Caritas International provided food, water and shelter, even where the aid works were themselves in danger of being attacked. And last but not least, Trocra. The Irish Catholic Charity has been raising money in order to support refugees from the current Russian-Ukrainian war.